Well, good morning, City. If you don't know me, I'm Glenn, and we're in the third of our series known as David Dialogues. Now, this series is a relationship series, and it's specifically trying to drill down on conversation. And we've been looking at the difference between a casual conversation, hey, how's the weather, did your team win, you know, we like, um, I like your team, we like your team, uh, everybody likes your team, nobody doesn't like your team, that kind of stuff. That's casual. Until somebody says, no, I actually don't like your team. And then all of a sudden we've gone from a casual to a crucial conversation where two opinions vary, at least two. And um, so there are three components to a a crucial conversation. Opinions vary. There's a disagreement. There's a conflict. There's not a point of agreement. And so then that leads to the second aspect of a crucial conversation is emotions can tend to get a little bit strong. Emotions get strong. You're like, no, I really do think that my team is the best. I am a shark supporter. And the person says, I'm sorry about that. I am a lion supporter. And so therefore, all of a sudden, emotions start to run. And then, depending on the relationship, whether it's, you know, it's uh, a friendship or if it's uh, a work boss um, employee relationship, a spousal relationship, a, a friendship relationship, the stakes are high. The stakes are high, and things can get said in those emotions because of the varying opinions <clears throat> that can, can say things that will, will have a lasting impact on that relationship, potentially. And obviously, the the greater the, the content, uh, you know, my team, your team, that's, that's kind of a little bit low on the totem pole of, of importance. But if you're starting to talk about beliefs or values or, or politics or whatever, all of a sudden the stakes start to rise. And so those are the things that we've been taking a look at and how do we navigate through these crucial conversations. Well, we're going to be taking a look at the third of the the three dialogues found in Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now, even if people have never, ever gone to church in their lives, and maybe this might be your first day. Welcome. Hi. And we're so glad you're here. Um, Even if you don't even know how to spell church, most people actually know about this story. They know about this particular narrative between David and Goliath. We'll even use it metaphorically. Oh, it was a real David and Goliath moment. Meaning, it was a real underdog versus the giant. And so we are very familiar with this particular narrative in Scripture, even if we've never even opened to it. We know that there's a situation between um, the underdog facing the insurmountable odds of defeating a giant. And so, as we open this particular passage, I want you to take a look because, again, the words that are spoken between David and Goliath will actually reveal what's in their heart. That's one of the things that we continue to see, that words just are not formed in our voice box. Communication originates in our heart. And the Bible speaks of our hearts as the sum total of our attitudes, our thoughts, intentions, motives, desires, and longings. And out of that heart, the mouth speaks. And so when we take a look at what is spoken, we're going to see the heart of a giant that speaks, but we're also going to see the heart of a champion that speaks. Now, before we dive in, I want to define for you the word champion. Champion in the Hebrew actually means 
a person who stands between the two. A person who stands between the two. One who steps out from the ranks and stands between the two. And in this case, we have two who stand between the two, the two being the armies, the armies, the, the armies of the Israelites and the armies of the Philistine. And so when we start to hear their language and start to hear the talk that is going, again, it's, it's real kind of battle, battle kind of war talk going on. And you may be wondering right now, well, how is this going to apply to my marriage? Um, you know, and I just, or how is this going to apply to my speaking to my child or my child speaking to me? I just want to put a disclaimer that some of the words that are going to be spoken need to stay in this context. It's a war type battle conference, but you probably don't want to say, listen, I am going to feed your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Oh, really? I'm going to be feed you, and I'm going to cut your head off. I mean, it's like, no, we probably don't want to, we probably don't want to use that kind of language. Um, this is a relationship series. We want to be a little bit more upbeat, and we want to be a little bit more positive than just saying, I literally want to take you out. So that's kind of what we want to, we want to avoid that kind of language. But we want to also sort of see what's the heart behind these words. That's what's in it for us. What's the meaning of the heart that speaks? And the very first thing that we're going to take a look at is we're going to take a look at a giant speaks from a heart of defiance. A giant speaks from a heart of defiance. Look with me in verse 42. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a, but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. Now, I just want to stop there for a second because I'm, I'm fairly confident that the biblical writer here inserted the whole kind of he was ruddy and handsome. I don't think Goliath, in the middle of this battle, got a man crush on, on David. Like, you know, I disdained him, but man, is he really handsome. I mean, you know, I don't think, I think there was kind of an insert. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think there was like a bromance going on here. And, um, and, then we, and then we went to battle. So he disdained him. See, the voice of defiance we see in verse 10, the voice of defiance is Goliath had stepped out and said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. And he did it for 40 straight days. It's the voice of defiance. And when a giant speaks with defiance, you know what follows? Disdain. Disdain. Disdain is a word that we probably don't use a whole lot. So I actually had to go back to the dictionary and find out what it actually means. Disdain means coming from a place of superiority and speaking down with dislike, contempt, and scorn. It's coming, it's like you, uh, I'm on a platform above you physically. But what is happening, giants speak from a platform relationally, from the side of they think that they're superior. And they look down on you, and they start speaking with dislike, contempt, and scorn. See, giants at the very heart of who they are. You could call them a giant. We probably know them as bullies. They love to speak down. They love to, to take the position of superiority because they're superior. No, actually, ironically, they suffer from insecurity. They're actually cowards. Giants are actually cowards 
who are insecure. And so in order for them to feel like who they are and who they need to be in their own eyes, they uplift themselves, they elevate themselves by putting other people down. And they're good at it. And so he looked at David with disdain. And then follow along with what comes after this. 43, and the Philistines said to David, am I a dog that you come at me? You come to me with sticks? And then the Philistine cursed David by his gods. He, am I a dog? In other words, don't you see that I am more important, that I am a man of, 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 of power? I am a man who is a battle-tested champion. Who are you that you would send this kid with a bunch of sticks to come after me? I am offended. And then he, it says he cursed David by his gods. You know the mother tongue of giants is cursing. They curse. It's not enough to just speak words of dislike and contempt and scorn, they have to curse. And the curse language in, in the Bible is one of condemnation and destruction. They want to destroy pieces of who you are. Giants are looking to condemn and push you down to a place of fearful submission. Have you, have you known some giants in your day? Have you had people who've spoken to you like this? Who then, then all of this is happening in a public forum. So they speak with a heart of defiance. They look at you with disdain. And they speak disgrace over your life publicly to, to absolutely intimidate and dominate before the battle even gets started. Have you had those in your life? I've had those in my life. But here's what I want to say to you. Here's what I want to say to me. Here's what God was preaching to me out of his word. Glenn Campbell, you've had giants in your life and you've had to face their disdain and you've had to face the disgrace of their words and their intentions. But Glenn Campbell, you also have a giant that lives within you. See, we, every person sitting in this room has the potential as we're going to see, to live a life with the heart of a champion. But we can also live a life where the words come out and the words of a giant. And we belittle and we put down ultimately to raise ourselves up. And we can do it in many different ways. You know, giants come in many different ways. Forms, shapes, and sizes. They do. And so I just listed a few. They can come as a demeaning boss. They can come as a domineering spouse. And this, this has no gender issue. It could be a domineering wife and a domineering husband. You're too much. You're not enough. It could come at you actually in the form of a disease. The giant of facing the disease of cancer. My youth, my youth minister growing up, great friend. We were in each other's weddings. In fact, he and his wife met each other at our wedding. 
He's fighting for his life. And the bully and the giant of cancer wants to absolutely dominate his life and intimidate him into fearful submission physically. And it actually then works upon you emotionally and then that spills over to spiritually. So giants come in all kinds of forms and all kinds of shapes and all kinds of sizes. Let me, let me, let me give you a couple others. You know, um, there's, the, there's the giant of the future, the unknown future. Man, does that scare people. I don't know what's coming next. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, I'm, I'm going to matriculate at the end of this year and I don't know what I'm going to do. Or I know what I'm going to do, but I don't want, know what it's going to be like when I get there. Every time you've ever had to make a move. What's it going to be like in this new city? What's it going to be like in this new job? What's it going to be like in this new country? It's intimidating. We face all kinds of giants. You know another giant that we face that every person in this room faces? And it's what I'm going to call an assumed giant. You know what the assumed giant is? Anxiety. Man, that thing is a killer. Anxiety. The things that are just literally alive in your own headspace. Do you know that anxiety, 85% of all anxiety that we think about, that we contemplate, that we mull over, 85%, statistically speaking, 85% of it never actually ever happens. And we're fighting a giant. The real. Some of the giants face us externally. The other giants we face are the ones that are within us. And God is calling us to move us from the heart of a giant to a heart of a champion. So, the language of cursing and the language of disdain and disgrace. The tactic for, for Goliath and David, and I want you to see this. The tactic that they use is in, in, in verse 44 is he's going to overwhelm him with a potential outcome, and the potential outcome is so horrific that it will cause David to shift his focus from facing the giant to going, oh my gosh, I'm facing my future, and it is not looking good. Look at what he says in verse 44. He says this to David. The Philistine said to David, come to me. I, like, I have to use this word, like this voice. Come to me. Yeah. Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Yeah. That's my best. I'm sorry. What in that day and even in this day, he's saying, I'm not only going to kill you, you're not only going to die, but I'm, we're going to leave your body in absolute, utter disgrace and let it be picked off by the birds of the air and the beasts of the field, and you will not get a respectful burial. We will not even, I will not even, your people will not even, because they're going to be so scared, because after we take care of you, we're taking care of everybody else, and your body is just going to decompose out, exposed. He's going in for the kill with this utter, this, these words of utter humiliation to shift David from the task at hand, from what he's been called to step out and step between to champion. And see, giants love to do that. They love to shift our focus off of the future, and put it on a, a future, a, a, a terrible outcome that is possible. And so all of a sudden, we start thinking about the possible outcome, and it consumes us. And it could have consumed David. He could have been like, ooh, I don't think I signed up for this. I mean, I stepped out, but I don't know if I want to take that kind of hit. And by the way, 
personal note. This is a freebie. When you and I, as champions, step out in courage, which is what God's calling us to do, and we'll talk more about that in a few moments, you're oftentimes putting a target on yourself. When you step out and stand up for others who can't stand up for themselves, you're going to end up being the target. But David doesn't back away. And look at how David speaks. So first, a giant speaks from a heart of defiance. Secondly, David, a champion, speaks from a heart of confidence. A heart of confidence. Look in verse, we're going to back up and go to verse 38. Remember how last week we said that he had this, this, this David dialogue with Saul. He had a, a crucial conversation with Saul. He's going, I will fight. Fear not. Don't give up hope. I'm going to do this. And Saul says, you can't go. You're but a youth. This guy's been a champion from He's been a warrior from day one. You can't do this. And eventually, Saul says, go and may God be with you. Which, by the way, we're going to see in a couple weeks, it was Saul's job to do this. But he goes, I'll let you be the champion. So David's going to stand up for, not only for Saul, but for the entire army, for those who couldn't. And then Saul clothes him. Look in verse 38. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with the coat of mail. David strapped on his sword, being Saul's sword, over his armor. And he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go. Here's the voice of confidence. I cannot go. With these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off, took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from a brook, and put them in his shepherd's pouch. And then his sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. I I cannot go. I cannot go with these. Saul, this armor is not only ill-fitting, it's ill-suited for my style of of battle, the way I operate, the way I roll, and this, and I haven't tested them. How is it that David could have the confidence to speak that way? See, champions can speak that way in confidence because they know who they are because they've been prepared, as we saw last week, they've been prepared in the wilderness. They know what they are comfortable with. And I, I want to pause here and, and, and just highlight the fact that there are going to be people in your life, even when you want to step out and champion, who are going to want to clothe you. Clothe you in their style. Clothe you with their expectations. Clothe you in their standards. Clothe you in their opinions. Clothe you in their wisdom and advice and you've got to test that you have to be able to know who you are and see true champions know exactly who they are and who they're not where did he get that identity he got that identity in the private the many private moments of personal worship with god where God was communicating, you're my chosen one. I called you. David, I, I, you belong to me. You're mine. And I'm giving you a mission, and the mission one day will be fulfilled. You will be king. But before you, long before you enter office, I want you to know who you are. You're mine. You're my chosen one. So it's not about what he does. It's who he be. And so David goes out in the confidence because God has told him who he is and who he belongs to. You can't step forward as a champion without knowing exactly who you are. If you don't, 
you will start wearing other people's clothing. You will, be, you will dress in other people's expectations. It's just a quickie. Uh, even good intentions. Parents would be like, man, this is just, I just have this dream for my son. I just have this dream for my daughter. And they drape that dream over their kids. But it might not be theirs. And it actually might not even be what God wants for them. For their unique mission. Dreams and expectations. You need to test that. And where do you test it? You test it in the private moments of worship. On a daily basis. David was a champion who was made. He wasn't born. God doesn't birth champions. He makes them. That is the very core definition of disciples. Go make disciples. Don't birth them. Make them. And God is saying the heart of a champion is somebody who is made. And where are they made? In the private moments of personal work personal worship and dialogue with me so then he moves on he moves on and he says this in reaction in response to the to the giant in verse 45 then david said to the philistine you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin now here comes the voice of conviction but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you've defied. Whew. Wouldn't you just love to speak with that kind of voice of courage? Listen, I'm guaranteeing that if you read between the lines, David still had some fear going on. Courage doesn't mean that you have an absence of fear. Courage just means you found a way to step through it and face it. So there are going to be giants who will knock you back, and you will have some fear going on. But in your confidence in who you know that you are in God, he will give you the conviction to step forward and speak with a voice of courage in the face of the giant that is out there and was in, that is in here. And i got to be honest with you. We're going to get to this in a couple of weeks. The giant in here is, man, it, it's as hard, if not harder, to topple. Because we're so used to living that way. And it's such a part of our heart. And all of a sudden, those words just go out at people. And even those whom we love and are intimate with. And we have to topple that giant within. So he speaks with conviction. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. I come to you in his name. I speak on his behalf. I'm not coming on my own accord. I'm speaking on behalf of God for these people. I'm willing to stand up for those who cannot stand up for themselves. And then verse 46, he goes on to say this. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I love it. He turns, he uses his own, he uses the giant's words. And I will strike you down and cut off your head. Again, this is not language we want to use in, at the dinner table. Okay, just want to be clear with that. Or at the lunch table or at the board table. You know, you didn't clean up your room. I am going to cut your leg off. You know, you don't want to be, you don't, you don't want to go there. This is battle language, but what, what is going on? Champions will speak with a voice of courage under fire. I'm, I'm stepping forward. The heart of a champion does not lose sight that God is sovereign over all things. Look at what he says in verse 47. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not by a sword or a spear, for the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into our hand. Our hand. This is a community effort. I know who the battle belongs to. I know that God is in charge. I know that God is, his plans and his purposes will not be hijacked. I know that God is good. 
He's good. He's always good. He's in charge, and the real battle belongs to him. See, champions know what battles to actually fight and who they're fighting for. Sometimes we get the battles wrong. We fight for the wrong things. <laughs> we fight for the little things, and we leave the big things. We need to know the difference. We need to be able to fight for the right things. And what are the right things? And that's where you spend time in the private moments with God going, you know what, just let that go. Why do you want to die on that hill? Why do you want to get bloodied on that hill? It's not that significant. Don't do that. Mom, don't. When, when your 17-year-old son comes in the door and he's, got, he's just had a long day, he's just come from practice, he's all sweaty and he's hungry, don't ask him don't just jump right in and just not only asking you about his day, it's that, that's okay, but then to dive deep in. Well, tell me what's going on in your heart. It's like not the right moment. I'm glad that you want to know what's going on in his heart. Pick and choose the moments in which you come at it. Mom, seriously, I don't, I don't want to talk about that right now, Okay. I just want to shower, and I want to eat, and I want to eat everything that's in that refrigerator. But I care about you. I know you care, but I don't care about talking about this right now. You just got to pick, you gotta pick and choose. So then David goes on, and here's how the rest of the thing goes. When the Philistine arose and came near him, Near to meet him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, and slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and struck the Philistine and killed him. I think that the author wants to make sure you know that. Because we've repeated that twice. And there was no sword in the hand of David. And then David ran over, stood over the Philistine, took his sword, Goliath's sword, drew it out of its sheath, and killed him and cut his head off with it. This is you gotta read the Bible. There's just a lot of cool stuff in it. And then guess what happens in verse 452? Because true champions actually inspire others. The ones who couldn't stand up for themselves, the ones who were fearful, the ones who had been just beaten down into submission by the giant, now they watch a champion and they jump in. And the men of Israel and Judah rose up with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that they wounded the Philistine so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Sharim as far as Gath and Ekron. Listen, when you step out in courage, I can promise you right now, your courage of stepping out is going to bring a wake of other people that will be inspired by what you do. And I don't know what God is calling you to champion. Actually, let me get. Let me get straight to the point. We're all called to champion in relationships. So who is God calling you to champion for? Who are you to speak up and be a voice for? Who are you to step out and stand up for someone who cannot stand up for themselves? Who? He's calling you and I to be champions. I don't know who that is, but God does. And in the private moments of worship, he'll reveal that. There's some of the ones that are obvious. Spousal relationships. You're to champion your marriage. Not 
fight with that person, but fight for that person. Big difference. Heart of a giant, heart of a champion. I'm fighting for you. I'm fighting for us. I'm not fighting against you. Big difference. There might be a giant that you need to get at in here that would help for you to champion a significant relationship. Parent, child, boss, employee, friendship. Who is God calling you to champion? There's one last point, and it's the most significant. He's the ultimate champion. And Jesus speaks from a heart of deliverance. See, Jesus was an unlikely champion. Just like David. He was an unlikely champion. He was one who came on the scene that no one expected to be the champion of heaven and to walk around among us. And as he began to live out his life in courage, he stood in the identity of the Father. He knew who he was. He knew exactly who he was. I am the Son of Man. And the Son of Man is a good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. I know my mission. And I, as the champion, am the champion who is willing to stand between the two. Between humanity that is defiant, that is full of disdain, and standing in all of their disgrace, I'm going to stand in between them and my Father. And I will declare that I, this unlikely champion, am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody can get to my Father except through me. I'm the one who stands between the two. And how will I do it? Will I do it with sword and spear? Will I show my military might? No. Even though I might be looking like an unlikely champion, my means of deliverance are also unlikely. You know how I will do it? With a couple of sticks and a large stone. One stick that goes this way, and the other stick that goes this way. And on the third day, I will defeat sin, death, and darkness. The three giants with a couple of sticks, and on the third day, a large stone. That's how God saves. That's how he saves people who cannot stand up for themselves. People who cannot defend the giants from without or the giants within. And he delivers us through the power of his sticks and his stone. What a savior. What a Savior. And over the course of the next few weeks, as we continue to look at these dialogues, I want you to look to the champion, the unlikely champion who stood between our disdain and disgrace and, and, and defiance and took us from a heart of a giant to the Father, and he gives you a heart of a champion so that you can follow in his footsteps. Champions inspire those whom they step out for. And he's calling you and I to follow 
in his footsteps. Let's stand and pray. <clears throat> the band's coming up. And we're going to end with a song, a beautiful name. David said, I come to you, Goliath, not with sword and spear, but in the name of the Lord of hosts. If there is somebody here who the giant within is still speaking with disdain and defiance and disgrace, and you're standing all alone. Know that there is a champion, and you know what a champion means? One who stands between the two. Jesus Christ stood between you and the Father. And in the words of John 14, verse 6, he said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. And no one gets to the Father with disdain, disgrace, and defiance except through me. Because through me, I took your disdain, your disgrace, and defiance with a couple of sticks. And I had victory when one large stone was rolled away. No one gets to the Father except through me. And if there's someone here today who's going, I don't have a way to get to the Father, and I've just realized that Jesus is the only way. Would you just quietly pray? Jesus, I give you my heart and my giant ways of defiance, disdain and disgrace and I know that you took it from me and you had it nailed to the cross into your flesh you bore all of it so that I might be reunited with the father and know that he's called me as one of his chosen ones. Holy and beloved. So that I might now live with the heart of a champion. If that's you, just pray something like that. Very simple. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you took my sin away. I need a savior and you're it. Please forgive me. Deliver me. And for the rest of us, in this message, in the powerful name of Jesus, would we get at the giant within? Because there is power in the name. Let us see.